part of First Baptist Church. Um, Connie and I have been here in September, it'll be nine years. And uh, we are honored to call you our family. We're honored to call you our friends. I just wanted to say a, a quick personal thank you for all the prayers and the cards and things for me as I've been recovering from surgery. Um, when some people have this surgery, the pain goes away immediately. That wasn't God's gift to me. And, uh, but it's gradually going away, and I'm feeling a lot more energized, and I'm feeling a lot better. I'm having to take some nerve pain meds that are really helping. Um, so I, I appreciate your prayers for me, and I appreciate you continuing to pray for me. There's some other folks in our congregation that are hurting physically and need some, some things done in their bodies as well. Um, I just want to take this time to, to, to plug the, the prayer card that's in the pew in front of you. If I weren't the pastor, you wouldn't have known of my need if I hadn't put it on a card. So if you have a need, we want to pray for you because we know that God works in response to our prayers. That's one of the reasons we pray for our spiritual cousins, the Muslims. We don't pray for them because, um, you know, they're like us and that they're spiritual people and they're seeking after God. We pray for them because they need Jesus. They need Christ. And when Christ enters their lives, he will radically change them. Some have said, why are you doing that? The last two years, we hosted a, an Eftar meal where we invited our spiritual cousins to come and have a meal with us during Ramadan. We didn't do that this year uh, strategically. We wanted to see the kind of response they would have since we'd done it for two years. So be praying about that. But we, as Christ followers, need to not be afraid. We need to not be afraid. Fear should not rule us. Our confidence is in Christ. And if somebody chooses to take our lives, or they are, it is required of us for some reason, we can gladly say, okay, God, my life is in your hands. Because everything we have, this life, all of our gifts, all of our abilities, and eternity is wrapped up in Jesus. It is secure in him. And so if you have a prayer need, please make sure to, to put that on a card, put it in the offering plate when it comes by a little bit later. If you haven't picked up one of the prayer guides, I want to encourage you to do that. If you have something going on in your world and you want someone to actually you know, meet with you and talk with you and pray over you, um, pray with you, we, we would really enjoy the opportunity to do that. Um, a couple weeks ago before my surgery, I invited the elders to pray over me. And they anointed me with oil and they prayed with me. And uh, God's presence has been with me through this whole time. Sometimes he heals miraculously. Sometimes he uses the physicians that he's gifted to heal us. And that's how he's choosing to heal me this time. God is at work. He is real and he cares about us. I think that's one of the reasons why he brought us all together today. You see, First Baptist Church has been called to be a force for good in golden and beyond by being disciples of Jesus. That's what our mission is, to be a force for good in golden and beyond by being disciples of Jesus. Now, for many, many, many years, and this church has been around 155 years, for many years, almost from its inception, we have supported people who we now call global ambassadors. They go out around the globe bearing the, the gospel message of Jesus. One of my favorite parts that's in our Friday Blast every single week is, uh, is this. You can see this picture up here. It's, called, it's uh, just the title, Global Ambassadors. And in here, this particular week, we hear from John Cornish, who, if you haven't read this, you need to read this. It's just about him sharing his faith with a, with a partner with uh, three different Muslim men and the interactions they had. Um, then uh, Keith and Paula Daly, they're both going different places. It's kind of kind of cool the way God is using them in separate areas, uh, particularly right now. And then uh, there's some stuff about alternatives, pregnancy. Terry and Trudy Thompson asked us to pray for um, international students who are headed back home. Lots of different things going on there. And then uh, the last one is what what Connie talked about, the uh, 30 days of prayer for the Muslim world. But we didn't show the video that's there. Every one of those highlighted things is a link. All you have to do is click on it. 
So if you would like to get the blast and you want this particular one, fill out the card. And Stephanie, I just put her on the spot. She didn't know I was going to do this. Stephanie will send that out to you this week so that you can see these things. There's so many cool things happening around the world. We support 15 missionary, that uh, Janet told me to call them missionary units. Not eunuchs, but units. Units, they're, they're either couples or they're single, single people. And we support 15 of them. We also support five mission organizations and we support one ministry f- people group focus. There's a specific people group that we are focusing and, and giving towards in, a, in an unreached area of the world, uh, the country of which I don't want to say. Um, that's what we do. That's what your part of our budget goes to. That's what your giving goes, goes to. But I have to say that as we have done for, for years and years and years very well reaching the world, being a force for good around the globe, I think from time to time we need to be reminded of what it means to be a force for good in Golden, in our community, in the communities in which each and every one of us live. Now, Tim and Janet Hall, a couple of our other missionaries who happen to serve with us, uh, they're at a, a speaking at a supporting church today. They send me their newsletter, and it gets posted in, in the blast when they give it to Stephanie. But they send me their newsletter, and they didn't know this, but, but they gave me the introduction for what I, want to, what I want to use as my introduction for the entire series for the book, for our study in the book of Ephesians that we're starting today. Um, Tim and Janet said this, baby boomers ask, is it true? Gen Gen Xers ask, is it right? Millennials ask, is it good? Now, they point out that there's just a very slight difference between the generations, but from their perspective, in order to capture the mindset of each of the generations, we need to add a couple of words. Those words are for me. Is it true for me? Is it right for me? Is it good for me? Americans have become people who judge the value of something based on its value to me. How it will benefit me. What it will cost me. What it will do for me. How it will draw me away from something else I'm really very interested in. Tim and Janet finished up this section of their their letter by saying, The missionaries who went out in the early 1800s responded in a different way. They responded, is it true for God? Is it right for God? Is it good for God? The great missionaries of any generation ask, what does God want me to do regardless of what I want to do? Is my life really all about me. James says, our life is like a vapor that appears for a little time then vanishes away. Imagine that your life is like this match. If I were to hold it until it burned down and let go because it were going to burn my finger, It might last, I don't know, what would you guess? How many minutes do you think this would last? A little more than five seconds. I'm having to help it here. (laughs) Lee, will you come grab this? (laughs) I was generous, and I said five minutes. It's not even really two minutes. Now, that's, that's the length of our lives compared to eternity. Now, we have the opportunity to either invest ourselves in this fleeting flame that will blow out quickly, or we can take our small light and we can add it 
God's blowtorch. We can add it and become part of something that's so much bigger than us. Life is short. Life is futile. And everything we invest in in this world, we will leave behind. Except God's word and other people. Every person you know needs the Jesus you know. Every person you know needs the Jesus you know. Louis Giglio, the founder of Passion Ministries, it's a, a ministry that reaches out to university students, challenging them to make their lives count for everything they possibly can. And the founder of uh, Passion City Church has said some things that I think you and I must hear today. If you hear nothing else today, please hear his words. We all want our life to matter. Is God there? Does he have a plan for me? Can my life make a difference in this world? Absolutely yes. And the answer is found near the end of Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 8. For your name and your renown are the desires of our souls. God, your name and your renown are the desires of our souls. When the Apostle Paul wrote the letter to the church at Ephesus, he wanted to help them understand how God was going to use them in the world to change it all. And this letter was meant to equip them and us to know what God's plan and purpose for our lives is so that he can use us in his plan to transform the world. So turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to be in Ephesians for the next 10 weeks or so. If you're using one of the pew Bibles, I'll make it easy on you. It's page 814. Ephesians chapter 1. <clears throat> Strangely enough, this book is not just about how God wants to transform the world. He's going to begin by transforming me and by transforming you. But he's going to spread out from us because he wants to transform us so that he can transform Golden, so that he can transform Arvada, so that he can transform Lakewood, so that he can transform Littleton, so that he can transform Brighton, so that he can transform Commerce City. That's how he will transform the world. It will be through us. It's amazing that God has this plan and he chooses to use us to accomplish what he has to say and what he has to accomplish. Now, in the very first verse, we see that God sent Paul with an authoritative message, not just to the people of Ephesus, but to every single person who's a follower of Jesus, to you and to me. So let's look at this verse together. Verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. I highlighted those on purpose. They're not highlighted in your, in your Bible because there's a really key thing that we've got to understand. Every disciple of Jesus is defined by two distinct locations. Currently, right now, you are in Golden. How many of you live in Arvada? Where you live is in Arvada, okay? So, so this, he's talking about the, the saints who are in Ephesus. That's your geography. And your geography changes wherever you go. So if you're in Golden right now, when you go home, you'll be in Arvada or Littleton or Lakewood or wherever. And when you go to lunch with somebody after, after, after worship, and I hope you do, you'll be in Inglewood maybe. Or you'll be still here in Golden if you go over here by some of these restaurants in Colfax. That's, that's the geography. We're all defined by that. But there's also another phrase. In Christ Jesus. Wherever you go, this never changes. You are identified as a Christ follower. You are in Christ. Nine different times in just these first 14 verses, 
Paul talks about us being in Christ or in him. And one time, he uses the phrase in the beloved in verse 6, and we'll see that in just a minute. So 10 times, he emphasizes the importance for us to understand that, that we are identified as someone who is in Christ. In golden is where I am right now. It's maybe where I live, but in Christ is who I am. Your identi- identity is not, not your job and it's not your, where you live. It's not even your name. It's Eric Clark in Christ. It's you and me in Christ. That is who we are. Not only does me being in Christ refer to who I am, it also refers to the very purpose for my existence. Living out the implications of what it means to be in Christ is why I reside where I happen to reside. Before we can get more into the purpose for our living, there's more that you've got to see about what is true of you and me because we're in Christ. Everything Paul is about to say to us, God has given us because of two very important pieces of his character. Everything you have, everything I have, even the very breath in our bodies is by God's grace. But the spiritual blessings we're about to see that that God has poured out into us through the Holy Spirit They're based on two basic things, God's grace and his peace. When God's grace comes into our lives, he puts us at a constant state of peace with him. He is pleased with us. Look at verse 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Not Not just a greeting, but he's telling us that God has done something for you that I want you to know. He showed you his grace so that you may experience his peace because what did Jesus say? In this world you will have trouble. But be at rest, be at peace. I have overcome the world. When we experience God's grace, he puts us in a state of complete peace. And when you are at peace with God, it doesn't matter what's happening in the world. If you know that God is good with you, then whatever else is happening in the world does not affect, does not matter. As a result of being in Christ, verse 3 says that I have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. When he talks about spiritual blessings, he's saying that the blessings you have have been given to you by the Spirit. But here's the other thing. When he talks about those spiritual blessings coming from the heavenly places, he's saying that they come directly from the hand of your Father. The Spirit of God is the one who channels them into your life, but they come to the Spirit from the Father. And it could only happen because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. The triune God is involved in everything going on in your life and mine on a spiritual way. We are blessed with every spiritual blessing, And they come to us through the Spirit from the heavenly places, from the hand of God Himself. God the Father gave all these blessings to us through the indwelling indwelling Spirit so that they could be ours to enjoy because we are in Christ. I want you to turn to the person next to you and say, I'm in Christ. Now we're going to figure out what in the world that means. Now, if you've put your faith and trust in Jesus, you've understood that you were a sinner who, who, who deserved, that you're separated from God and you deserve to, to spend eternity away from God in, in what the Bible calls a, a Christless hell, then you're not in Christ. But if you've put your faith and trust in Jesus, then you are his and he is yours and you're in Christ. And everything we're about to talk about is yours already. If you've not put your faith and trust in Jesus, everything we're about to talk about can be yours today. It can be yours today. If you will take that step. Put your faith and trust in what Jesus did for you. So, 
as we begin to approach this book, rather than simply accepting these blessings, my response should be to bless God. You might think to yourself, well, wait a minute, my response ought to be to say thank you. Well, that's exactly what will happen in verse 15 to the end of the chapter. But the first 14 verses, Paul doesn't say thank you right off. He says, look how God's blessed you. And guess what? The response that that should come from us is to bless him. Now, what in the world does it mean to bless God? God has everything, right? Anybody have a someone in their life that you can never buy a gift for because they have everything? My mom is that way. She told me, don't buy me any more gifts. I got everything I need. Well, what do you give a God who's got everything, right? What does it mean to bless God? To bless God means literally to speak well of him. Now think about the past week. Think about it. All the conversations you had, how many of them included you speaking well of God? Give yourself a month. Two. How many conversations included you speaking well of God? Can I tell you a secret? The way First Baptist Church of Golden will become a force for good in Golden, or Arvada, or Littleton, or Lakewood, is when his people begin to make it a habit to speak well of God. To tell other people what God has been doing in their lives. Because that's what we need to do. To bless God is to speak well of him. Now with the words of Isaiah 26, 8 that Louis Giglio quoted for us earlier, with those words reverberating in our hearts, may, may his name and renown be the desire of our souls to make Jesus famous in our five-minute flame is life itself. Let me say it another way. Maybe the flame thing doesn't do it for you. You and I are each the, have the opportunity to be the star of our own lives. You can have the key major role in your own story. Or you can ask God to give you any part in his grand story. That's what Paul is all about in this first chapter of Ephesians. So one clear, constant application of what we're about to learn about ourselves and, and throughout the entire rest of the book of Ephesians is that we should be speaking well of God. We should be telling everyone we come into contact with what blessings God has abundantly poured into our lives to make him famous. Because every person you know needs to know the Jesus you know. The rest of this section down through verse 14, chapter, verse 3 to 14 is, is all one long sentence in Greek. It's the longest sentence in the New Testament. Paul, it's, it's like Paul got so wrapped up in who God is and all the things God gave us that he just, he just kind of rattled off and, and didn't stop. And, and it, there's so much insight and so much really incredible things here for us to learn from. But he did it all because we're in Christ. He wanted us to know what it means to be in Christ. So, so now he's going to tell us, why should I speak well of God? Why should I speak well of God? There's four reasons um, the way this chapter breaks out that, that you and I should speak well of God. So we should speak well of God because, first of all, he chose me. He chose you. I want you to say that. He chose me. Okay, two of you, two of you help me out there. Everybody. He chose me. Think about that. God chose you. Listen to what it says. Even as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world. When did he choose you? When did he choose you? Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. When did he choose you? I can't hear you. Before creation. Before anything that is ever was, he chose you. Now, you really want to make your brain fry. Think about that. Now, that means before he created anything, he chose you. Before you were conceived, he chose you. Before you took your first breath, he chose you. Before you betrayed him, 
whether it was this morning or five years ago, he chose you. That does not mean that we can live as we want, however, because his choosing was for a purpose. Look at it. This is the rest of verse 4. That we should be holy and blameless before him. He chose us before the foundations of the world so that we would be holy and blameless before him. He wants a people who are holy and blameless. Now that passage does not say that he chose you and so you have to be perfect. As if all the effort was yours. What it does say is when he chose you, he had a purpose for you to become like Jesus, to transform you so that he could then transform your home and transform your community and transform our state and transform the world. He's choosing to work through us. He doesn't want just First Baptist Church of Golden to be a force for good in Golden and beyond by being disciples of Jesus. That's what everybody's about. That's just the way we say it. He chose us so that we could become like Jesus. But here's the thing that really blows me away. Why did he notice me? Why did he notice you? Verse 5 says, In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. Catch those first two words? In love. Why did God choose you? Because he loved. Now, he didn't love because you were lovely. He loved because that's who he is. That's his character. You and I did nothing and could do nothing to warrant his love. In Ephesians chapter 2, when we get there, we'll see the, the, the sentence that we were all under. I, I would just, if anyone wants to, read ahead. The first three verses of Ephesians chapter 2. I don't want to spoil the surprise. But if you want to read it for yourself, you'll see why. We couldn't do anything to make him love us. We actually did everything we could to make him want to turn his back on us. But he did not. He also did it to shine a spotlight on the character quality we first started off with. Grace. This uh, verse 6a. To the praise of his glorious grace. God is not a mean and hateful killjoy. He's a loving God who longs to be gracious to every single human on the face of the earth. Telling someone what God has done for you shines a spotlight on his grace. Because it was God who saved us and called us to a holy calling, 2 Timothy 1 says. Because, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. And then here we go. How he chose to accomplish that, the sphere in which he chose to accomplish that, I told you this would come up in verse 6, was when those, for those who are in Christ, those who have relationship with God through Jesus. So verse 6 says, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. With which he's blessed us in Jesus. He chose you. He chose me to become like Jesus before anything was created because that's the kind of God he is. Does anyone here have any reason to speak well of God? <laughs> Anyone else have any reason to speak well of God? I mean, think about that. He chose you before there was anything. He chose you to be like Christ. And he gives you the Holy Spirit, we'll find out in just a minute, to help you do what he's called you to do. God never calls you to do something that he doesn't also equip you to accomplish. That is who God is. That is what he wants to do in your life and mine. He chose us, and the second reason we need to speak well of God is he wiped out our debts. He wiped out our spiritual debts. They were all stacked up against us. Anyone who stands before God in their own sin won't have a leg to stand on. 
we will be lost for eternity. But God himself took our spiritual debt on himself when Jesus hung on the cross and died in our place. He wiped out my debt. Verse 7 says, In him, that's Christ, we have redemption through his blood, through the shedding of his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. He paid for my sin, all of them, past, present, and future, when he hung on the cross and he died in my place. He paid for your sins. He paid for our spiritual cousin's sins. He, he paid for the sins of that person in your life that is just so hard to get along with and feels so far away from God. And you think there's just no way he paid for them as well. Because every person you know needs to know the Jesus you know. He chose us. He and, and he wiped out our debt. Does anyone here have any reason to speak well of God this week? Sean still does. Think about it. Think about what he's done. He chose you, he wiped out your debt, and he gives your life purpose. He gives you something worthwhile, eternal, to do with your five-minute life. He allows you to become part of his grand story instead of settling for being the star of your own five-minute reality show. He gives us a life purpose. Verse 9 and 10 we read, Making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him things in heaven and things on earth. We get to join God in his plan and his purpose and his grand story of uniting everything under Jesus. We get to add our five-minute flame to his eternal blowtorch because Jesus is at the center of God's plan. God's will was revealed and it continues to be revealed as the fullness of time came and his will and his plan was to unite Jew and Gentile, male and female, everyone, every tribe, tongue, and nation under heaven and under one person in Christ. Now catch that. You are in Christ. I am in Christ. All of creation will be united together in Christ. That's God's plan, and it will happen. It will happen happen and we get to be part of it so here's how I picture it as Jesus hung on the cross he became the bridge between heaven and earth and more than just a bridge he became the unifying point the unifier of heaven and earth now don't miss something really extraordinary here God does not do this begrudgingly Satan did not back him into a corner he is not mad at you because you sinned and you needed a savior he did it because he loves you. He wants to show his grace to you and to me. The song we started with. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our sins. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. That's Isaiah 53. Verse 10 of Isaiah 53 says that, that it was God's will. One translation says it was God's good pleasure to crush him. Not that he wanted to hurt his son, but that he looked past that to the joy of you and me coming to know him. Be able to being in Christ. In both verse 5 and verse 9, the phrase that the ESV translates according to the purpose of his will is better translated according to the pleasure of his will. It was his pleasure to accomplish this. His plan, including the pain, alienation from his own son, the sacrifice, all of it results in joy when you and I put our faith and trust in what Jesus did for us and come into his family. It brings a smile to our Father's face because he loves us. 
In Luke chapter 15, several times, Jesus says this phrase, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Every time somebody puts their faith and trust in Jesus, turns from their sin and turns to God for forgiveness, heaven throws a party. Does anyone here have any reason to speak well of God? Think back to that day when you put your faith and trust in Jesus. There was a party then. I've often kind of wondered, wouldn't it be cool if that party was still going on in my heart? God is organizing the entire universe, heaven and earth, around Jesus Christ. Jesus is not just the means by which God unifies it all. He is also the focal point of it all. And he enlists you and he enlists me in bringing it about. He says in 2 Corinthians, All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, here's where we fit in. We are ambassadors for Christ, making God's appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And I want to implore you, if you're here today, and you've never recognized and acknowledged your own sin, and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, bowing your knees to him, be reconciled to God today, I implore you. And you will be given the opportunity to take your five minutes of stardom or flame and add them to his grand story. He chose you. He wiped out your debt. He gave your life purpose. And the final reason that you and I should all speak well of God is because he gives us a secure and eternal inheritance. He gives us a secure and internal inheritance. Listen to what he says in the last few verses here. In him we've obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. We belong to God. He chose you and he chose me. We are his daughters and sons. He not only wiped out our debt, he also gave us a purpose for life and he gives us an inheritance. So we, we were in the red in our spiritual account and he wipes it out so that we're, we're down to nothing. But never at any point is our account really down to nothing because as soon as he took out the, the, all the, the wickedness, he put in all of his inheritance. He put in everything we would ever need. It says he did it according to his riches, not out of his riches. If he did it out of his riches, that would mean that it would be depleting the amount of riches he has. But because he did it according to his riches, that means that all of his riches are accessible to us. Think about that. Everything we need. And that doesn't mean that I ought to be able to pray and get whatever I want. We understand that. However, if God chooses to do something, he certainly can. I have prayed for people, and God has chosen to heal them. I have prayed for people, and God has chosen to heal them gradually. And that, that's, that's the case with my, my nerve pain. And what keeps coming back to me is when Jesus healed the man who was blind, and he said to the man, he said, can you see? He said, well, kind of. I see people, but they're walking around, and they look like trees. So he did his thing again, made, made mud pies and put it on his eyes, and he, and he healed completely. God may choose to do it in a gradual way, may choose to do it through physicians, but we know that we have access to all that God has. That's what it means to be in Christ. And then he said in this, in this section that he sealed the deal by giving us the Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit is the earnest money. It's the down payment. He's the down payment that, 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 that is God's promise to say that what I've begun in you, I will finish. 
Philippians 1.6 says, He who began this good work in you will be faithful to complete it. We can be secure in our relationship with Jesus because God made the promise and he gave us the Holy Spirit. He is our down payment, the earnest money. And he is also the guarantee that each child of God can partake and finally take possession of this inheritance. The Holy Spirit is inside every follower of Jesus. And he's there to remind you, to assure you, to strengthen you, to encourage you. As you follow after him, that Father's pleased with you. The, we can grieve him. We can go places we shouldn't go. We can look at things online we shouldn't look at. We can say things we shouldn't say. But the Holy Spirit convicts us. And if the Spirit is not convicting you, you might want to talk to God about that because that's what the Spirit does. And if He's not convicting you, He might not be there. I would hate for someone to be a good churchgoer, to be a nice person, and go to hell. Jesus did not come to turn bad people into good people. He, turned, he, come, he came to turn dead people into living people. The Holy Spirit came. When you put your faith and trust in Jesus, and he gave you all these blessings, chose you. What else did he do? Someone help me. Wiped out our debts. What else did he do? He gave us a purpose for life. He gave us an eternal and a secure inheritance. Does anyone in here have any reason to speak well of God? Do you want your life to matter? I mean, this might be a little bit hokey, but the reality is our lives are brief. This goes longer than a vapor, like James said, but I think it makes the point. We can decide what we're going to do with our lives every single day of them, or we can cooperate with Jesus and what he's doing and the spirit who's in us and ask God what he wants us to do this day. How he wants us to represent him. How he wants us to speak well for him. Even though this section of Ephesians has been about how God has blessed us, life isn't about me. Church isn't about me. Heaven isn't about me. It's all about God gracing us with a part in his grand story. Do you want your life to matter? Trade your five-minute flame, your five-minute starring role, in for the story, in the story of your life, for any role that God the Father would give you in his grand story. Today you are in golden. Every day, wherever you are, you are in Christ. Whether you're in field study, whether you are vacationing, taking summer classes, you're gardening, you're shopping, you're driving from one place to the next, you are in Christ. Whatever you do, however you are gifted, do it in such a way to make Jesus famous. He chose us. He wiped out our debt. He gives our life purpose and he's secured for you and me an eternal, an eternal inheritance. This week, I want to challenge you to meditate on those truths. Mull them over. Think about them. Chew on them. Second, ask God to drive them deep into your soul so that his name and renown becomes the desire of your soul. Ask him to drive them deep to the deepest part of you so that it becomes just second nature to speak well of him. Tell somebody, third, what God has done for you. Does anyone here have any reason to speak well of God? I guess what Paul's inviting us to do is to trade our five-minute starring role for any part in his story, or if the match is something that relates to you better, trade
trade your five-minute flame for his eternal blowtorch. Let's pray together. Father, I, I want my life to matter. I want this church's life to matter. Golden is lost, and happily so, toddling off towards an eternity without Jesus. Help us to be so enamored with who you are and what you've done. Lord, let it be that we, we can't help but speak well of you in every conversation. Father, transform each of us to make us like Jesus. Transform our minds and, and the things that we see as valuable and the things that we hold tight to to be the things that you value and that you care about. If you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, or maybe you haven't, and you haven't sensed the Spirit in your life, and you want to make it sure today, I want to give you an opportunity. Nobody's looking around. It's just, just you. Uh, you can pray a simple prayer. I'm going to pray one, and you can pray it after me. You can say it with your own words. God, I know I'm a sinner. I have broken your laws. And because of my sin, I am separated from you. But I understand that Jesus took my sin on himself when he died on the cross for me. I put my faith and trust in Jesus right now. I ask you to forgive me and to make me a new person. I invite you to rule and reign in my life. If you prayed that prayer before the offering plates come around, grab that card in the, in the pew in front of you and just mark the, the appropriate box. And if you'd like to talk with someone about it, I would love to reach out to you this week. Now, with everyone's eyes closed, except mine now, if you are a follower of Jesus and you are saying today, I want to trade my five-minute flame for Jesus' blowtorch. I want to be involved in this grander story. I'd like you to raise your hand. I want to pray for you and me as we make that commitment. Jesus, thank you for my sisters and brothers. Lord, I pray that you will just continue your transforming work in each and every one of us. Give us all that you promised so that we can become all that you planned. In Jesus' name. Amen.